how the scientists that were working on the esoteric weapons, they basically disappeared. It wasn't just him. There were others that disappeared as well. There was some presence down in Antarctica that was a threat to humanity. There is indication in some of our data that there was some type of downed alien type craft that they had gotten a hold of, but never truly able to figure out the whole platform. They mapped the continent and found an oasis that kept the area warm. And th that's where the Nazi base 211 was allegedly established. We remote viewed that whole situation. We, we wanted to try to understand, you know, what was the intention of Operation High Jump? Because for one thing, it just seems like a lot of military hardware for an expedition and, and scientific research. So that was what we saw with this. This was, this was an extension of World War II. You know, the world believed it was over, but it wasn't over yet. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Metaphysical Podcast. All right. So in the past two episodes, we talked about the strange facts of Antarctica, the Antarctic Treaty between the countries of the world and why the frigid continent is mostly off limits to civilians. But in this episode, we want to go deeper into Antarctic's past. Did you know that the Nazis went down to Antarctica in the 30s to research? What other secret missions were they on? And did they succeed in building a base down there? And how about the United States, which was obviously keeping a close eye on Nazi technology and progress as they watched the world come to a war? The infamous Admiral Byrd, the highly decorated U.S. Navy hero, led a huge scale mission called Operation High Jump down to Antarctica. And what he encountered has been up for debate for more than 75 years. What did he really see down there? And what did the global powers learn that may have shaped our technological future? Well, join remote viewer John Vivanco and me, investigative researcher Rob Counts, for a show that's out of this world. If you're listening to the Metaphysical Podcast, you're watching us on a video platform, go ahead and just leave us a five-star review. We truly appreciate that. It's going to help us help us quite a bit. Make sure you like and subscribe wherever you're watching us. Well, John, it's time to talk about the uh, the villains of the universe here, the Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Hey, did you know, I just need to say this. Did you know that Admiral Byrd was one of, I think, three or four officers who had a medal of himself? So he had a medal with his face on it. He was like one of two or three or four officers that were allowed to wear the the medal of himself on himself, like wherever that, he went. That'd be Isn't that crazy. Bizarre. Like, yeah, uh, that I, is epic. I would not be able to take that medal seriously, really. Uh, like you know, I I can can you imagine like the backyard cookout discussions over that medal? Yeah, no kidding. I know. I mean, geez, like that Admiral Byrd was, you know, he was an epic guy. He, he was, was a badass. Yeah. Yeah, definitely a man's man, kind of just extremely intelligent, extremely capable. Yeah. Yeah. Did some weird stuff either with inner earth, Nazis and UFOs, possibly. Something was going on, definitely. I mean, he he was allegedly one of the first to explore the areas of the North and the South Poles. Is that true? If this is contested, but he was the first person to fly over the North Pole. Right. Yeah. Of course, right. people had explored these areas before, but when you're talking about flight, it's a little bit right. of a different thing. Right. There is all kinds of debates over what was going on with the Nazis down in um, in Antarctica, because there is evidence uh, in 1938, and 1939, that German the German Navy went down there, went to Antarctica to find an area for a German whaling station, allegedly, as a way to increase Germany's production of fat. Now, this fat would be used to make things like margarine and soap. And previously it was being purchased in large quantities from Norway. So it would have saved them tons of money in import getting it themselves. What's 
kind of interesting about this and my history of the things that were going on at the time is this actually really checks out with what was going on um, in around 1938 and 1939 when different areas of the world were putting more and more pressure on the Nazis and, and taking them out of any kind of trade. They would have had to be a lot more responsible um, you know, individually for all of the things that their that their country needed access to. And then also, <clears throat> when you consider we're talking about a war going on where you're trying to feed your troops and fat is a probably a massive, hugely important thing. And whale fat is among the richest of all of the fats that you could potentially be looking for out there, right? So that actually does check out why the Germans would go down there. But with Germany, <sighs> it's too convenient of an excuse because why you have to ask, like we're talking about a highly occult organization that's constantly looking for lost artifacts to ensure their power for a thousand year Reich. Which, yeah. Not my words, their words, obviously. Right. Right. And they would have been into the really extreme esoteric side of, of flying saucer development, the Nazi bill um they would have been they would have been so and you, you know that you have those stories about maria orsic on top the psychic. of it, the psychic who was supposedly connected to beings from all aldebaran aldebaran and giving information on this kind of stuff and she was supposedly part of the ss nazi party i think on the ss side the yeah. ananerve Yes. Yeah. And a lot of people think that that this is all woo woo stuff. And then I don't even know if people really think that this was a thing because it's been talked about so much on like ancient aliens and stuff. Right. like that. And, you know, people that have any sense of credibility are going to be like, well, the big hair guy was talking about this, so it can't be true or something. But yeah, right. that, that's we're talking about the realities of of what was really going on down in over in Germany, the 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 Thule Society, the Ananerbe, all of these societies that that John was mentioning, they were occult societies before they were socio political. They were highly occult, in fact, and and Germ Germany or the way that Hitler really got into everyone's home was by having a. Uh, a belief system revolved around Germany that he was, he was, it was, you know, people call it nationalistic about where, where the Germans came from and all of that stuff. And that, that is partly true, but I think you're missing the point here. If you're not considering the occult side of the entire thing and the madness behind the Nazis and like searching for these relics. And we have an entire series. We brought this up before on uh, Rise.TV called The Relics of Power. And if you want your minds blown, definitely go and check that out because it goes through and explains why Indiana Jones became a massive hit success. Like these are st stories that are being retold of Hitler going to search for these artifacts. You know, Captain America won stuff. It is plausible that that this was a practical thing, that it was just for fat or something like that. Of course, you know, when you're talking about the the machines of war, it really could have been that. But is it more likely that the Nazis had some kind of knowledge or belief that Atlantis was down in in Antarctica, that there was an entrance to um, the inner Earth there where he would find these Aryans that he was looking everywhere for? He was in Tibet looking for them. You know, he was looking in different places for these things. Did did they have some information that was ahead of their time and they were going down there to look for these things. What do you think, John? Well, I think that they believed, so they were, they were searching for Atlantis. Um, they were, they were trying to find, they felt that um, the upper echelon of the Nazi party felt that the Aryans, them as a race were connected to that older civilization and Atlantis and all the relics and these lands were their birthright. That was the massive effort that they put forth in order to find these things, um, to claim them because of the legends of the, you know, mystical supernatural type of technology and weapons. 
Uh, and, and that was that was one of the things that led them to Antarctica was was my understanding, the belief that Atlantis and that stuff existed within under the ice. Um, not just that. I mean, you you can probably set up a very fine base there within the ice that's, you know, pretty impenetrable. In fact, Admiral Donitz, who was one of uh, the advisors to Hitler and, and the Nazi party, he had said publicly that we have built an impregnable fortress, a Shangri-La land for the Fuhrer. And many people thought that that was down in Antarctica. Mm. Look at this. Look at he's like a brainiac. Wait, go back. Look at look at the size of that man's head. Yeah, his like, head is wow, award winning. The the whole statement he made: an impregnable fortress, a Shangri La land. As he said, a Shangri La land, which is a curious statement to make because, you know, Shangri La, um, inner Earth. That's, you know, all mixed up there, right? That is part of the whole lore that they were looking for. And then, you know, you had the Roricks before World War II who were funded by the U.S. government, possibly the, the Russians, to find um, Shangri-La or um, Shangri-La, Shambhala, same, same thing. So it's got strange words, right? You know, ties into, you know, what previous governments have been looking for. So, well, and and just to back you up, I mean, they really were into building these strange bases for the Nazis. Look at uh, Kronzberg Castle, for instance. Kronzberg Castle was Hitler's alleged bunker. It depends on, on which sources you're reading here, but there are sources that a, a lot of occult activity happened at this castle as well. And oh, this, I don't this, know. I've never heard of that. Yeah. Uh, this is in the Alps, actually, John. Uh, who know? I mean, who knows what's even underneath that thing? Right. You know, what would they have right. been doing there? I think that they did. They were successful in setting up at least some rudimentary base in Antarctica. Um, but it's more than what people know, um, which we'll get into a little bit later because of the remote viewing data that we have around this. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. So this this, um, you know, we're talking about. Uh, high-ranking Nazi scientists and military units um, setting this this whole thing up, reportedly, right? And now we get into this whole discussion on Diglock because what Diglock reportedly could do was it, it, it was an anti-gravity um, mechanism that the that the Nazis had, I think, reverse engineered from alien craft. Uh, now, it was reportedly exotic energy tech that could affect time and energy, which has given just so rise to so many theories that Hitler is a time travel, that he didn't actually die, that a bunch of them disappeared. And that's why Nazis are the villain of every movie that we go to see for some reason. Um, now, there there is now these are very fantastic claims. And I think it's important to point out that there really were these things called Foo Fighters that were being seen by World War II airmen uh, and, and that these were craft that, that had propulsion that was an incredible speed that they could not explain. And uh, now Foo, I found out a little bit more about this. There were, the word Foo was kind of uh, considered like uh, almost like Fooey. Right. Like the word fooey. It was a, it was like a catchphrase at the time. And they it just stuck with these things. They're called like foo fighters, you know, like almost like crazy fighters in a way, because it sounds so ridiculous to even talk about. Uh, but they were not a hoax. These were these were real things that the that the fighters were 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 talking about seeing. And the the now de Glock had this Nazi symbol on it, reportedly the foo fighters. We're not really sure if those had had the Nazi symbol on it, uh, this swastika. Uh, so, yeah, here it is. Last week, U.S. night fighter pilots based in France told a strange story of balls of fire, which for more than a month have been following their planes at night over Germany. Hmm. No one seems to know 
what, if anything, the fireball balls were supposed to accomplish. Pilots guessing that it was a new psychological weapon named it and named it the Foo Fighter. So that's the, interesting. So they, they thought it was yeah. a psychological weapon. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but really, uh, a lot of questions come up here. First, what what really were these things? Were they Nazi technology? Because why wouldn't the Nazis be blowing these things out of the sky if they were? The 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 problem with this whole theory that the Nazis had to Glock, that the Nazis created you you know UFOs or anti gravity machines, um, doesn't really add up. Because the Nazis lost the war. If they had that technology, why didn't they win? They would have crushed everyone. Yeah, of that's exactly there's, it. There's other factors, of course, but that it really comes down to the there. There are certain facts about the Nazis that they were, for instance, trying to build a nuclear reactor, and they were unable to really complete the nuclear reactor. Well, that that's the case with all this stuff. They were the the more exotic side of technology. They were not able to complete. That's what we've seen. You know, the f whole Foo, Foo Fighter thing. Look, you know, a lot of people will see things in the sky and then just call it a Foo Fighter. So, you know, not all of it was something, but there is indication in some of our data that there was some type of downed uh, alien type craft that they had gotten a hold of, but never truly able to figure out the whole platform. But they had the bits and pieces of it. They were reverse engineering stuff. Yeah. Like yeah. people do. Trying to figure it out, right? Um, so that was the whole, you know, I mean, that was also part of Operation Paperclip with the U.S. brought Nazi scientists over. It wasn't just the rocket scientists. It was it was really primarily these guys that were working on the Diglock system. But, you know, I think a lot of that disappeared down into Antarctica. You know, what John is talking about right now isn't, necessarily known information because right. on the surface it looks like the operation paperclip was bringing over rocket scientists chemical scientists and more analog type of 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 things but we i truly believe when we look at some of the operations that have been conducted like montauk uh even uh, I mean, gosh, even MK Ultra and all of these things. I mean, we're we're talking about a gigantic cluster F of of, right. of scientific knowledge that has all been kind of, you know, contained within different people. But what doesn't really make sense is the fact that no one really knows what happened to Hans Kammler. Well, Hans Kammler was one of these disgusting looking Nazi generals. Who he's like, he's like straight out of the Indiana Jones, like evil. Oh, yeah. Like they, I think they probably used this guy's picture yeah. to cast so many people in, in Indiana Jones, just because he has that look about him, you know, but Hans Kammler was really, um, he was said to be in charge of, of the advanced weaponry that the Nazis were, um, developing. And what's really interesting about his story is that the moment that the Nazis surrendered, Kamler jumps in one of their very advanced jets and disappears forever, and no one ever found him or his plane. And so, of course, there's tons of Nazi theories revolved around this right. guy because of that. What happened to Hans Kamler? Was it, did he go down? Did someone shoot him down? Did he just go down over the ocean? I mean, debris would have been found of his plane or, or was there something else going on? And he had, he had an out, obviously he had an out and he had a plan or else he wouldn't have left in the, um, rushed manner that he did on the particular plane that he jumped on. Right. Well, I think there were, there were other scientists too. I, I think I had heard something about, I mean, obviously, you know, this is, undocumented stuff, but something about how the scientists that were working on the esoteric weapons, they basically disappeared. It wasn't just him. There were others that disappeared as well. And that is the whole speculation of them like ending up in Argentina or Antarctica or Antarctica by the way of Argentina. So, and that goes into Operation High Jump though. Like, yes. you know, 
Because yeah. see, this is stuff that the that the U.S. wanted. That the U.S. wanted what they had developed, and they wanted those scientists. Yeah, and they would have done gone. anything to to get it. Right. Be because this is we're talking about military advantage, and and sort of like Michael Schrat had mentioned like our our military would be very forthcoming in its intentions on those things to say it nicely right. here you have a government years before funding an expedition to shambhala to try and uncover supernatural weapons and then you have the nazi party who potentially had created or been on the path to create supernatural weapons yes they're going to go after that Yes, they're going to go out. No, and, and this is not a huge stretch of the imagination. No, it's a not. lot of people think that this is crazy talk, but we're talking about Hitler looking for the Ark of the Covenant, looking for the spear of destiny, the spear that 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 punctured Jesus's chest. It actually goes back way. The history goes back way longer than that. He was looking for relics of power to try to take over the entire world. This is where he was at. I'm not saying you have to believe in what he believes. I'm just telling you what Hitler was doing. This is documented stuff. So when it when it comes to alien technology or anything that this guy could have gotten his hands on, now what's really interesting is this name Ravenscroft is a very particular name. Trevor Ravenscroft, right? If you go back to Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark, when the CIA agents brings Indiana Jones into a room, he tells them that a man named Raven something was actually the most well-known person with the Ark of the Covenant. And the story of the Ark of the Covenant in that is the story of the Spear of Destiny in that movie, because their, wow. their, their relics are similar, actually, in what they do and, and what powers it would give to the individual in control of it. Right. Right. So they kind of crossed over the Spear of Destiny with the Ark of the Covenant, and the entire movie was about the Ark. But he even uses Trevin, he, he uses something like Raven's something. I can't remember the exact name, but it was like, I was like, I, I, after reading that book and re-watching the Ark uh, of the, the Raiders of the Lost Ark, I was like, wow, they are really well researched. Like, they researched this whole thing, you know? They were reading the books I'm reading now to figure out what's going on with Hitler. Yeah, this is this is fascinating stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is. It was and, uh, Ravenwood in the movie. Ravenwood, thank you. So it was Ravenwood's in the movie. Raven Ravenswood in the movie, but it's Ravenscroft who wrote the Spear of Destiny book, and it's a very very fascinating read. There's a lot of people that will tell you, "Oh, this wasn't true. This is baloney." But I encourage you to read that book. Why not? At at very at the least, you just read a really great piece of fiction, but I don't think it is. I think there's too much in there that rings true when you read it. Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, talk about fiction. I mean, you can hide anything in fiction. What's the book? The book, it's called um, uh, Heller's Tale. Oh, I thought you were going to say Stephen King's It. Just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, well, that too. But Heller's Tale, it's an Antarctic novella mm. that Eric um, Hecker spoke about, right? So that he kept saying, you know, it's it's a fiction, nonfiction, it's a fiction book, nonfiction, right? On a, on a story where they, uh, where he, I'm guessing it's him, I'm guessing he wrote the book, where they went into uh, some of the old bases and found some strange things in Antarctica. So, but it's- I it's gotta read this. Tale. Yeah, yeah, definitely read that. Well, and and yeah, he, he apparently is the welder in this book, Hecker, according to what he was saying is not him. Right, <laughs> right. Which is really funny. We'll be getting into that, uh, uh, Eric Hecker's um, statements in a future episode. But, but what was Operation High Jump? So, and why why has this been behind so much of the conspiracy theories or the theories of what really happened or what's going on in Antarctica? It's it's important to go over. So this this is in 1946. Okay. It's the largest, most heavily armed task force for the purpose yeah. of scientific and military research. We're talking about what was it, four thousand troops or something like that? Yeah, I think, you know, aircraft carriers, tons of planes, 
destroyers, Wep weapon lots of weapons, lots of weapons. And, and the and the goal was he sent he sent almost five so he sent almost five thousand men to the, to this whole thing and and the idea was to be there for eight months to do all of this research eight months eight months and it's important to note they were they were only two months in when when the plug was pulled and it was called it, it was called for uh, poor weather conditions it's Antarctica what did you think was going to happen they knew what they were getting into when they were going down there okay so. Now, the claims are that this, this operation was also because the U.S. wanted to extend U.S. sovereignty and allegedly, now, check out this Nazi base. This is where Right. They wanted to create Little America, right? Yes. It's called public, public side. That's right. So uh, in 1938, now this was several years earlier, almost 10 years earlier, MS Schwabenland or something like that boat went down to Antarctica and the occult Thule society was with them. In fact, now the idea, okay. I say, in fact, I should probably cover this. This is the theory. Okay. So the Thule society was apparently with them allegedly, and they wanted to find secret, uh, to find a c secret underground base and make, uh, contact with the beings there. In that time, in on Operation High Jump, uh, they mapped the continent and found an oasis that kept the area warm. And th that's where the Nazi base 211 was allegedly established. So this Nazi base was called Nazi base 211. Now, Kamler allegedly disappeared around this time. And he developed secret spy planes and there were tons of UFOs seen around South America just when all of this was going on. Kamler and Nazi scientists thought they'd escape to Antarctica, so they went down there. Uh, I'm telling you guys what is commonly known. I'm not saying this actually happened. I'm just reiterating that, okay? Now, Admiral Byrd, the youngest admiral in Navy history who received tons of awards for his heroism and bravery, he was highly decorated, Sent almost 5,000 men, as I said before, in a task force to Antarctica, stocked with the best weapons in history. No scientific study was ever done. Apparently, they built a base. And after he, he talked to the media and came back, Byrd never talked about the mission again publicly, which also has led to a lot of arguments about what really went on down there. Right. Yeah, and there was, you know, what added fuel to the fire was potentially a mistranslation to the Mercurio newspaper in chile when he was in port because they were using a port in chile uh to resupply and stuff and and have it as a stopover there were rumors that there were a lot of um wounded uh military men coming through that area right through the port to receive medical attention uh and admiral bird said something akin to uh we have to be aware that we could potentially have fast moving aerial aircraft of some sort coming over the poles to attack us. So a lot of people interpreted that as being UFOs, aliens or Nazis. Um, but you know, there's a translation issue there really. There was, so there was a translation issue there. The, I think it got translated and understood as being UFOs, but, I think in the language, I think this was related to normal aircraft you'd see in the sky. Okay, now maybe, yeah, maybe we that's what we're going to try to discuss in this episode. So now the conjecture is that they supposedly went to recover a UFO type craft the Nazis had. All right. And according to some stories, there was some presence down in Antarctica that was a threat to humanity and the Germans and Americans tried to fight off this UFO threat. Now that's where'd you hear that? That's the stats different. What different accounts of this entire thing have stated. Now, some of this information that I just kind of railed off was contained in the diaries of uh, the re alleged diary of Admiral Byrd. Uh, but I'm trying to go over what the known theories are so that we can get yeah. down to the nitty gritty of what actually happened. I guess the real question is, was Operation High Jump simply to do 
experiments. What the what the surface claim was, we can't go to Russia uh, to do experiments with our troops in cold weather training. So we're going to go down as far away from them as possible, down to Antarctica, and we're going to conduct experimentation down there for eight months, which is a very long time. It lasted two, and they hightailed it back home. Right. Admiral Byrd never talked about it again. Right. What, what do you think, John? Well, you know, we did, we remote viewed that whole situation. We, we wanted to try to understand, you know, what was the intention of Operation High Jump? Because for one thing, it just seems like a lot of military hardware for an expedition and, and scientific research. I don't know, maybe, maybe that can happen where they bring, they don't know what they're going to face, whatever. But, you know, after the end of the war, the Nazis did, did set up base there. Like, like they did set up a base there. And so, yeah, because when, when we remote viewed this, when we remote viewed this, like what it was about was that we were literally getting symbology around Nazis in the data with all sorts of military hardware and a base in a very icy area, Antarctica. Wow. And so we had them like dug in, but see, the thing was, was that they were not necessarily just dug into the ice. They were dug into some ancient structures that were under the ice. So, so their Shangri-La land, like Donitz had said, their Shambhala was related to an ancient civilization as well. Like they had found under the ice, some remnants of an ancient civilization and they were dug into this. And so, so the United States with Operation High Jump was going down there specifically because they also knew that these scientists that were working on the Diglock and the esoteric weapons program had totally disappeared. And they assumed that they were down in Antarctica because they had brought down all of the pieces of that program to recreate it, to keep going with it um, down in Antarctica. And so... So that was the whole intention of Operation High Jump was to go and route out the Nazis to get them out, to get rid of them. So that was that was what we saw with this. This was this was an extension of World War II. Uh, you know, the world believed it was over, but it wasn't over yet. A highly classified. Highly classified, right? But now when you when you bring up this idea, this question about, well, if the Nazis had UFO platforms, like this anti-gravity platform, they could have easily won the war. And they could have, but they didn't have it. Not even down in Antarctica, they didn't have it. They may have had some very rudimentary, simple stuff going on, but not enough to fight this huge military fleet, this armada coming down on top of them. So, okay, so you got two things happening here. You've got you've got the idea that the U.S. went down there to get the Nazis out. Then you have this other idea of the, sh the fleet being attacked by UFOs, right? So people assume it's the Nazis. You have all this just like craziness coming together, the, the craziest ideas coming together into one big ball. What the U.S. encountered down there was not the Nazis attacking them with anti-gravity platforms, UFOs. They were not attacking them because they were in the same boat, more or less, as the U.S. being attacked, harassed by something else, something that was not from this world because of what is in Antarctica. So these were not Nazi UFOs attacking the U.S. fleet because if the Nazi UFOs could attack and chase the U.S. fleet off in two months... Why didn't they win the war? That would be the whole world after that, right? Right. The whole world would be under Nazi rule. Well, I mean, more I or less. Kind of, yeah, more or less, right? That idea. So instead, what it was, was the US and the Nazis. This is where the treaty is coming from as well. When you get to the Antarctic Treaty, the US and the Nazis had to begin to work together on this front to try to understand what was happening. And then later on, this is why you have a Antarctic treaty because of what was initially going on 
in Antarctica. And it started with the U.S. and the Nazis. So the threat was so great that kind of what we were talking about before, where everybody just has to put down their differences and fight. Right. That like everybody becomes a one global community all of a sudden, and you're fighting an external or extraterrestrial force is what. Right, right, exactly. Wow. So the intention of these beings were to drive the fleet away. It was like, like in our data, it was expressed as they had the feeling of this is ours. This is ours. You can't have this. This is ours. And so they could have decimated the whole thing, destroyed the whole fleet, but it was literally just to drive it away. It wasn't to kill every single living thing. It was just to drive it away. Now, when you get to the Nazis and that the Nazis did have this type of technology and they were able to attack the fleet, it would just would have kept going. The war would have just exploded on a totally different level. Um, and, and so these beings, it's, it's like the moon. Um, when we view the moon, the moon and the beings that are there, it's the same thing. It's like, this is ours. Stay out unless we invite you. Just stay out unless we invite you. There had to be like after that deals made with the beings that were using that area in order to begin to, and then building around the edges, building around the surface to begin to sink their teeth into it and to all everybody work together because you have this totally different threat happening now. That's really what we found. That's what we saw with this, this whole so are story. You, are you saying that the treaty down there really is to work together in order to understand this threat better? Because yeah. Wow. Yeah, basically that. And that was the beginning of it. And I think, you know, you have all those uh, rumors of Eisenhower, for instance, making deals with these beings as well. And that, that's like all around the same time. Like it's in the same time period where, where treaties were not just made between humans. Treaties were made with those beings as well. And from what I hear, this... Okay, and this is like all conjecture here, of course, right? right. That Eisenhower was hard pressed. He didn't want to make this deal. He felt like he had to. That was what I've what I've yeah. heard. Yeah, that was basically what it was. That's what we've seen with remote viewing data is that he had to make some kind of deal. There was like nothing, nothing anyone can actually do about it. Um, you you made the deal and that's it. There was no other way, no other way at all. Other, they'll just take whatever they want anyway. So, you know, they figured, oh, well, maybe we can get some technology out of this. So let's, let's negotiate. Let's just see, right? That's when the whole military industrial complex was created in that whole time frame. And then you have, you know, now companies like Raytheon and whomever else, like, like in a position where they're probably working with the beings that are felt like they were in control of that area. Now they probably are working with them. Yeah. And, and there is a lot of strange things going down there, according to this whistleblower's account, uh, right. Eric Hecker, that we'll get into in um, probably the next episode. But some of the lingering discussion or questions uh, around what John was just um, dis talking about in your data, I'm not sure how specific it got, of course, but like, was it that Hans Kammler escaped to the Antarctic base and he was yes. down there with a bunch That's, of other folks? Yes, him and a number of others. They like, because we, we looked at with remote viewing, like what happened to them, like when they disappeared, the reason for their disappearance. And we always get them in a very icy location. Mm -hmm. So this is not just him. This was, this was other scientists that were working on that esoteric weapon side. So yeah, he, he had disappeared with the rest of the scientists down there. And the U.S. wanted to find these scientists too. He's like Operation High Jump was huge from that perspective. Find, the, find that technology, find the scientists, destroy the base in Antarctica. That's literally what the mission was, according to our data. Well, and calling it Operation High Jump kind of makes sense if you're talking about technology. Right. To make a giant leap up with technology. Oh, yeah, right. So... Yeah. And then there was also th this account that was really interesting of a bunch of bodies actually routing through South America that people were seeing coming through there. And 
um that just kind of begs the question like was was there actually trying to be driven out of this area like we said eight right. months did it they only flee from two. antarctica to argentina or did they use our you know what i mean yeah. and was actually, there there are tons of germans in argentina and chile i've spent a lot of time down there and there are tons of germans there tons from yes. world war ii and tons of twins in certain areas which we'll get into in a separate episode <laughs> um yes so that's really really fascinating so there definitely now is a much more solid connection that we have to antarctica and the bottom tip of south america definitely operation high jump seems to be a operation to increase technology and they went down there they saw things that they did not expect and they engaged in some type of aerial and or sea warcraft we literally we literally have like like anti-gravity craft ufos aliens gray type aliens and others that are in ships that are attacking that are attacking like just going crazy blowing things up and and we don't and using exotic weaponry like like directed energy weapons and stuff like that and it wasn't meant to just sink everything sink the ships and all that it was they meant could to have. get out of here right um so yeah sinking I mean, everything would have been way too messy and would have brought more attention to it so right getting them out of there would have been a wiser thing to do right right and what what's down there like what it seemed to be was that there were there was ancient technologies that were creating something like a location where beings can pass in and out of easily, like a gate type area where beings can move in and out of easily. And it wasn't just the, the big headed, big eyed grayish type beings. There were other types of beings too, because this is an area where there is some kind of gate based off of ancient technology that exists under the ice. And that was just it was like this whole other rabbit hole oh, of man. Data and information that we get. So we just like get this edge of it. And it's like, OK, well, we're going to leave that alone. And we're going to have to look into that aspect later because it's like data leading to something absolutely, totally unknown. Right. It's not like you have any sort of even a scant bit of evidence, photograph, uh, something that someone said. You literally just have. It's hard to task off of remote viewing data is what I'm saying. <laughs> Correct. Right. Oh, man. Wow. Very, very interesting stuff. And you guys, we're just in the middle of this whole conversation here uh, on Antarctica. In our next episode, we're going to go deeper into the, some of these things that John found. We're going to be getting heavily into these whistleblowers that have come out recently talking about uh, speaking of, you know, energy weapons, what's really going on in Antarctica down there, according to these whistleblowers, we'll be getting into all of that. Stay tuned. Hope you guys loved this episode. And uh, we really want to hear what you guys think about all of this. Any thoughts that you have, theories that you have, things that we missed, whatever it is, this is a conversation with you guys. So please, uh, you know, don't hold back. Let's hear what you guys have to say. Um, please also, if you can, Make sure to subscribe to us here, uh, especially on uh, some of these platforms like YouTube, Spotify, whatever, so that you get the latest and greatest that's coming out. Yeah, thanks for everything, you guys. John, um, awesome to be with you as usual. And for everyone out there, I hope you guys thought this episode was as out of this world as we did.